but and um, oh okay and we are live okay hi everyone oh I see so many friends and faces hi like, everyone yeah. hello welcome to uh, our annual summer of Sarah McLean <laughs> um if you're not familiar with me I am Kelly I'm one of the founders of seasonally booked up uh, we just spent our summer reading some incredible historical romances featuring STEM protagonists, uh, including Knockout by Sarah McLean. Um, there it is. Thrilled to have joining with us. I know. Look at a huge ass poster. I know. <laughs> I, I, yeah, she's enormous. But now I'm like, she just lives in my office now because yeah, I love her so much. <laughs> so. Oh, well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us and for being here tonight. Thanks for having me. I'm always, this is my favorite thing to do. Every book. So I, if you sad. didn't invite me, I would be sad. <laughs> and we would be sad too. No, this is <laughs> so wonderful. Um, I you know I have a bunch of burning questions for you. Um, I know that our members do. Um, so we'll save some time at the end. So everyone, if you have questions, hang on to them. Um, but yeah, no, let us dive right in. Uh, I'm so excited to talk about these two. Um, and I was listening to uh, your Faded Mates episode with Jen, where you talked about knockout and you were saying how much you were kind of surprised by how much you really love this book yeah well so I mean you're always a little bit surprised <laughs> like I mean maybe not maybe not most writers but I'm always a little bit surprised when I get to the end of a book and I'm like oh I actually really enjoyed that yeah. <laughs> on, ba <laughs> on balance I enjoyed the experience of writing that I enjoyed yeah. hanging out with these characters and then you get to the end of it and especially I'll say this is the third in a four book series and I'm always a little bit nervous when I write a four book series because it can be, it can start to feel like, oh, these people again. <laughs> and um, I definitely do not feel that way. Like I dove right into Duchess's book. I'm so, I still, I love these, these women very, very much. So I'm, I had a great time writing it. And then at the end, when you sort of come back around to it and you've read it, you know, when you you by the time the book is done I've read it I don't know a dozen times and I mean you know with all the editing and the revisions and the copy edits and the line edits and all the different ways that you you look at a book yeah. and so usually a dozen times in you're like I hate every word in this book <laughs> everyone is going to hate every word in this book it's so boring it's so predictable it's so you know all of those things and at the end of the you know, whatever the 12th read, I really didn't feel that way. I was like, I really love this book still. So I don't know if that's good or bad, but it is a new experience for me. <laughs> so I mean, like to quote Tommy, right? Like perfectly lovable. Like the two of them <laughs> are just so explosive, like on the page together. Um, I'm curious what your favorite like scenes or moments are having like loved this book so much? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I really love the scene with Tom. So no spoilers or spoilers? No, Everybody's spoilers read them. all the way. Okay. Spoilers all the way, yes. Um, I really love the scene with Tommy's family, which is a completely, again, new thing. I don't usually write heroes who have family or rather if they have family, they're not like a great family. Yeah. Um, and so I was surprised. I don't plot. <laughs> So there's that too, right? So you show up, we showed up in, uh, in Shoreditch and, um, and it felt like, oh my God, he has a family. He has a family and he has like a sister and a mom and people who love him and who tease him and who, you know, welcome Imogen into this like warm, loving world that is so different than the world that Imogen grew up with. And still she feels so comfortable in it and I think it I love that scene for lots of reasons but I love it especially because I think it shows both of them coming to realize like how important the other one is to them and um, I'm always really fascinated all I want to do in romance and all I want to read in romance are books about identity right like the search for our truest self and people who love us for it um, and people who help guide us to that sort of truest self and I think that scene really does it beautifully and then plus there's the kind of pivot moment in that scene where you know the baddie comes in and we start to sort of every it just feels like that scene for me felt very much like it was the place in the book where there was gas on the fire yeah in I, both I feel 
both for the romance and for the plot. Yes. And I love too, right? You're talking about being the truest version of yourself and something you do with Tommy in this book. Uh, that's one of my favorite things that you do as an author. You've also done it with Bourne. I know that you don't love Bourne, but. Uh, oh, Bourne's fine. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I love Bourne fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I love those times in your books where a character thinks of themselves with a certain name. And as the book goes on, that name changes. Oh, yeah, and Tommy. Thomas goes to Tommy after he yeah. kisses him. And he kind of takes this moment. It feels like of finally doing something for himself, going after this woman he wants. Mm -hmm. And that's this dynamic shift. And it feels like it is. It's to his truest self. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a thousand percent. What's actually really funny about that is that I think I spent, I spent more time, you're not the first person I've heard say, like, clock that moment in this book. Um, and I, I spent so much time thinking about that moment and where, where it should be in this book, because Tommy has been Tommy in my head for three years, right? For three books. Um, because Im he's been Tommy in Imogen's head for three books. And there have been sort of jokes in the earlier books about how she refers to him as Tommy. And then all the heroes are like, you can't call that man Tommy. Like, that's not a, this is a serious person. And that is not a serious name. Um, and so for me, he's been Tommy. And so what was really weird is in the beginning, in the first draft, like, he was, it was very difficult to think of him as Detective Inspector Thomas Peck. Right? Mm -hmm. And then... Um, and my editor, you know, who really just did uh, t did so much work with this book with me, just trying to keep keep me grounded in it because there is so much happening in the world in this book. And she was, I mean, she really tethered me, which was she was it, she did an immense amount of work with me on this. Um, but one of the things she just kept circling was like what's happening here? Like, why does this say Tommy? Like, where is the moment? Mm -hmm. So um yeah, I'm glad you liked the the ultimate choice, but yeah. it was a lot of that was a lot of work to figure out when when he saw himself through her eyes. Yeah. Because she never saw him as Thomas, never not once in three books. So yeah. And I think too, it feels she especially saw him from the beginning. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think it's so important too where that moment falls for him, because this is such a growth book mm -hmm. for Tommy, right? He has this whole journey um, of realizing that he is like working in this corrupt system and like the role that he plays, despite where he's come from and the way that he's kind of working against the community that raised him. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm curious about how you set out to shape that journey, because I think you did it so beautifully. Um, and Thank in a you. way that felt like it really honored and supported Imogen at the same time. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, obviously Tommy's career was not an easy one for me to navigate. It was, um, you know, this book came out, the, this book, the seeds of this book were established in the summer of 2020, um, during the midst of a pandemic and protests and, um, Black Lives Matter protests and a big conversation in the world about what criminal justice looks like and what justice looks like in the hands of, um, you know, police in a lot of ways. Uh, and so for me, there was no question that Tommy was going to have to grapple with this, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think there is, there are certainly, I think you get sort of in historicals, you get kind of a, 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 a sort of pass with Scotland Yard, but I didn't want to take that pass. Um, and so uh, for me, it felt very important, not only that Tommy grow and evolve and that the book end the way that it does where you know we talk all the time about historical romance being the realm of fantasy right mm -hmm. um i get to leave the scotland yard of the mclean averse hopefully better off than than the scotland yard of the real world right yeah um but there was no question that he was going to leave leave the work um and and figure out another way to think about justice but he had to do that himself, right? And he had to have that growth on the page, I think. And he, Imogen had, 
Imogen's been around. She knows. She knew from the beginning. She knows what the police are and how they can be manipulated and how power corrupts. And that's the whole story of the bell. She's not surprised by this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would be lying if I said that it was easy. It was, I, I grappled a lot with it. Um, you know, and there are things that now, even now, you know, three months after or whatever, a month after the book came out, six months after I finished it, like, it feels like, oh, well, maybe I should have done this slightly differently, or maybe I should have, you know, I should have tackled this piece instead. Mm. And I mean, you can only do what you can, what you've done and uh, come back around. But I'm very proud of Tommy. I very, I think like he did the work in a lot of ways. Um, and I'm very excited about what his future looks like. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, I guess that's how I feel. Yeah. No, I, I definitely see that. And, you know, so as I know that you're a big uh, Miss Scarlet and the Duke fan. Yeah. Um, and we are currently watching it as a group together. We just. Oh, started yeah. Three. Oh, um, my God. Wow. Yeah, I know. So, fun. <laughs> so, yeah, the next episode, they have their like little date together. We're so excited. <laughs> uh, but, you know, have you gotten to this the episode in the prison yet in the jail? The that one's uh, earlier, right? No, there's a there's an episode that's like almost entire. No, I think it's later. I think it's like see, episode seven mm -hmm. or eight. Okay, and it's like entire. I'm not in a jail. It's in like an an old prison, an empty prison. Yes, 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 yes. And that episode is like a pure, the purest form of a romance novel. It's yeah. I won't spoil it for anybody, but it just felt like that's the episode where I was like, oh, these two just have to smash. Yes. <laughs> like the letters I want to write to PBS. I'm like real mad. So. <laughs> get get, the, get well, it together. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we clearly write, we're drawing a ton of parallels. Oh, of course. The and the book. Um, and I do want to ask about that connection. But I think first, something I know that we struggle with often in the show is the Williams kind of willful ignorance. Yeah. Now, blind. Yes. Yeah. Faith it's in so, the police. Like, deep in like the patriarchy here mm -hmm. of like kind of wanting the power it allows him, his own status, this huge chip on his shoulder. And like, so reading Tommy's journey, I was like, this is what I want for Will, you know, yeah. like finally getting that. Yeah. Wanted from the show, mm -hmm. the book, you know. I, it's funny because I think, obviously I have seen Miss Scarlet and the Duke, right? So there's, so yes, I have seen Miss Scarlet and the Duke. And there are, I have a lot of feelings about the show that I have a lot of, like if I were in the writer's room, I would make a lot of different choices. I actually find Scarlet sort of like, insufferable so um but the like but I do I mean I love I mean I love a lot about it I also love a, a I love a historical procedural like Ripper Street is one of my very favorite shows ever because it's basically law and order but make it Victorian um so anyway um do <sighs> William's problem or my rather my problem with Tommy was that there could be no situation. I, I just couldn't see a path for Imogen to love him or for me to love him or for many readers to love him if he were in this kind of willful ignorance space. Mm -hmm. Like for me, it felt really important that Tommy have a reason why a promotion to the head of the detective, you know, of the, the detective branch of Scotland Yard was vital to him and it felt um it was really important to me that it feel authentic and personal without it being about like I must like be a cop you yeah. know like I wanted him to see ultimately I wanted him to both obviously like believe in justice and believe that there is justice and believe that justice is for everyone um but not feel like the police were the only path yeah. to like the system, not that the patriarchal sort of system of criminal justice was the only path. Um, so for me, Tommy is, he is less wedded to Scotland Yard at this beginning of the, of the book than I think William ever is because for Tommy, Scotland Yard is a means to, you know, supporting his family to uh, thanking to like it. There's a lot of guilt and gratitude wrapped up in his relationship with Adams 
his relationship with his father. Like there's lots of, all of that is packed in. So it's more like an emotional internal thing than it is a sort of blind faith in policing as a solution to crime. I agree. Yeah. And I think too, you're right. I think that's exactly where as a reader, you can like really connect with Tommy, love Tommy, feel like good about supporting Tommy. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, you're not this like, this is my passion. Yeah. And I think also like I made some really uh, intentional decisions about like how we see Tommy at work. Mm -hmm. Um, It could have, you know, the instinct of course in these books, I mean, we've all read a bajillion books about Scotland Yardsman, uh, if we're historical romance readers, right? The instinct is to, is to sort of put them on page and have them vanquish foes. And and like, you know, here's a robber. And now I've caught a robber. Now, you know, here's a, you know, here's an, a, there's a person committing an assault. Now I've caught that person. And I wanted very much to be intentional about the kind of crime that I put on the, on the page, especially because the mythology of the last two of my series, probably all of my series, if you really dig deep, is like, be good, do crime. So like, for me, this sort of negotiation of what crime it me what crime means and who, you know, the value of it in, in a lot of ways, how crime can be sort of twisted and shown in a different way, the sort of the, the curious values that come into play when you're dealing with like noble scoundrels who are just the characters that I'm most interested in. But Tommy's not a noble scoundrel. There's nothing scoundrelly about him. Imogen is a noble scoundrel. Yes. Um, I'm sorry to Dana because I'm going a little off book right now. So there is an official banner for this. Um, But I think in talking about this sort of like great vanquishing, saving the day, it really has me thinking. Um, I think so often in your books, right, the two characters save each other. Mm -hmm. But I think that is like even more alive in this book and in such a tactile way because Tommy is like aggressively like, let me save you. Let me save you. And Image (laughs) is like, get out of here. Um, But then she kind of keeps stepping in in all of these unexpected ways to save him. Yeah. Uh, this is a book that kind of has these high stakes. People are literally after them at one point. Um, so I'm curious how you kind of balance those moments of the two of them saving each other and kind of the exchange of power emotions like that happens in those scenes. Yeah. One of my favorite scenes in the book is uh, the one where they're on the docks and she's diffusing the bomb in the, in the warehouse and he is, he comes so unhinged because he is out there on the dot. Like he is doing the saving, right? Like there is, he is out there. There is a fire. He is in the line. He is like, you know, Hatt- Hattie and Witter there. Like it's an old, it's old home week for everybody who's a Sarah McLean fan. Um, and like there they are like with water. And then suddenly he realizes that like the work that he is a part of, which is essential right like fire i think the line is something like fire is the hand of god right on the london docks like that is the most important work that he can be doing because imogen is already inside doing the piece that's important and he's not an explosives expert right so i love that scene a lot because he i could write him kind of feral right where he loses his mind and is like i must get to her and protect her but also there is a really keen push pull there. And I actually think thinking about it, talking about it, um, I think initially I wrote that the scene inside the inside the uh, warehouse, I wrote it from the wrong point of view. I think I was in her point of view and not his, or I can't remember wh- whose point of view I was in, but I was in the wrong point of view. And that's something that I talk about a lot. Like, I do a lot of rewriting scene. I, most scenes in my books are written. I have versions from both points of view because I'm, this is a problem that I have. Like it's always wrong. Um, But it was so important for him to have to take a beat in that moment where she's like, you can't come closer to me. I am dealing with like literal blasting liquid. Like you, if you come near me, things could go totally wrong. And he has to control his instinct to save her. And at the same time, like she is, that moment is really important, I think, for Imogen, for the reader, because we need to see that she is deeply capable, right? Like 
we have seen her blow up a jail cell like la di da here's oh i happen to have this like jar of gunpowder that i made in my bathtub but like this is imogen being so competent and so the two of them really do have to wrestle with this although i don't think imogen wrestles with it at all i think imogen's like i am very competent you are very competent together we will Mm -hmm. like sort this out as long as you're on my side like you have to be i mean the cornerstone of the whole series is like sisters before misters right like as long as you can respect the bells then you can be part of a of you know you can be mine exactly and i really love the scene that comes after the docks where um she's stitching him up yeah and it's the well, danger- i love i mean that's like a real classic like, mclean so good <laughs> But Someone's like, going to need health care and it's going to be the other person who gives it to them. Right. Um, but it's <laughs> the danger has passed. He's a little calmer. And you see like that competence porn, right, of him getting to see her skills. But it, it's almost like erotic to him that mm-hmm. the skills are being used on him. Like there's this extra yeah. level in place of not only witnessing her competence, being in awe of it but being the recipient of it, which is such a cool layer in that moment. Like after he's kind of had this entire, like I can't control the situation and I want to so badly, which is just beautiful. Well, thank you. I mean, yeah, I love a, I love a scar. I love a wound. I love a, I love a, we need to, you know, sterilize this thing. We do. Sew you up. (laughs) All right, we have a few minutes before I want to switch us over, and I have too many questions left mm. always. Um, I, do, I have kind of a slightly off-topic question, but one I'm really interested in. Um, so your Faded Mates co-host, Jen, right, mm-hmm. obviously has been a huge fan of him yes. and Jen and Tommy for a long time mm-hmm. um, and, like, wrote her own little Twitter. I know. Tommy thing. goes boom, right? Tommy goes boom. And I know authors kind of have a complicated relationship with fan fiction and like kind of the whether they can or should or want to read it. So I was curious if you had read those or if it was something you like saved for after you finished it. That is a good question. I don't think there, as far as I know, there are not that many. Um, there's only, yeah, there's only like a handful. A of few. Them. There was also like a really hilarious, uh, somebody else also put together like a hilarious like screen fake screenshot of like a twitter back and forth between imogen and tommy that was very funny um i don't as a matter of course read fic uh i don't even know that there is fic for my characters i don't tell me if you've written it because i don't i don't i don't (laughs) it feels that feels weird on a number of levels for me like what why why would anybody want to do that um but also no Jen's love of Imogen and Tommy is was terrifying. Like, I think I said this on the podcast. Jen does not read. Everybody thinks, oh, Jen gets all my books. Like, she reads all my books. She's an, a brilliant editor. Um, she does not edit my books in large part because, like, I want her to never see the sausage being made. Like, she sees the sausage being made, like, when I'm like, I can't record. Like, let's just record yeah. something. Like, let's record something that I really know a lot about because, like, I'm so strung out and I haven't showered in three days. But um, she doesn't she doesn't read my books before they're finished. And this book was really difficult. Like the weight of what if Jen doesn't like this? Um, I do remember why I remember seeing one or two and thinking like, oh, those are so funny and thinking like, oh, God, Jen, don't do it better than me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I think I probably texted her and it was like gotta scale it back a bit because like what if I can't do it as good as you <laughs> it's such like a unique position to be yeah. in oh, here we go I got my life back okay well I would be remiss if we did not talk about the Duchess oh, um, yes. who I mean I like went Daryl. <laughs> <That's laughs> well, like, everybody had to know something was up my sleeve, right? But yeah. well, I think we did not. Like, we immediately went wild in the Discord. Like, oh, yeah. Was like, 
who is she? Like, have we met her before? Like, who is he? Like, what is, you know, like, yeah, you know, clearly, I think we all envisioned a, oh, it's like a second chance romance. And then you just like swooped in with this right. cool new you know, thing. She's, I mean, she's a, she's a con artist. Um, I, I'm excited. I'd like, listen, I, I will tell you, you all know this from listening to me talk about the series before, but like, I don't start a series unless I know what that moment is like in the third book where it all sort of twists. Um, when I wrote Bare Knuckle Bastards, like the, I knew two things. One, I knew Ewan would obviously come back and be a hero. And I knew that he would have to burn the dukedom down. But I also knew like that Grace was going to come back in this at the end of the second book and like punish him for all the, th like, for all the things he had done. So I, uh, in this book, I knew before I even started Bombshell that um, Duchess has been stealing essentially from her husband. Well, not her husband. <laughs> um, <laughs> like very publicly taking the, taking the role of Duchess and using his money and power to get what she wants. Um, so I... I'm not going to tell you too, too much. I'm not going to answer any of the questions you asked. Um, <laughs> but what I will tell you is that um, she has a really good reason and he has a really good reason for being back. Okay. For like finally showing up. So, um, and they are deeply not happy with each other at the beginning of this book. Like they have both, they are both like done with each other at the beginning of this book. Um, which is fun. It's I, it's been a long time since I've written. I mean, these th I've written three books where characters have three books in a row where characters have really been into each other from the jump. Yeah. So um, I'm excited for a little more like a little more enemies to lovers. Like they both truly believe the other one is ruining their lives. So <laughs> and Duchess sort of worse than every anybody because she has a huge plan. I mean, like she has been, the whole series has been moving toward a very specific thing, a very specific enemy. And mm -hmm. um, he is fucking it up. So we yeah. have also been theorizing about kind of that end game enemy. Cause yeah. we're like, well, we're taking on Scotland. Yeah. Like where, so. Well, there's really only one more, right? One bigger one. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> Where? I don't know. I don't know, you guys. I'm not done with it. Who knows? All right. But from the beginning, I was like, well, if you take on Scotland Yard in book three, you only have one more place to go. So, well, we very much are eagerly <laughs> awaiting our next December of Sarah McLean chat where we can actually get into all of yeah. that. So that will be a joy. Um, all right, I'm going to toss one more question out for you before uh, we bring in some reader questions. So if y'all have questions, feel free to toss them in the chat so Dana can get ready to pull them up. Um, but for me, I really loved the little subtle connection to uh, the Bladesmith Queen that oh. exists in this book. Teeny um, tiny, yeah. Little line, um, but I thought that that story was like the mythology, the fabulism, it was so captivating. It was so like such a joy to read. Um, and I was curious, I feel like you just, I don't know, it just felt like such a gift, you know? And I was curious if you would ever kind of consider writing kind of something in that vein again. So I'm guessing you mean like medieval fantasy, which yeah. is what it kind of is. Um, Honestly, I do, I really don't feel like I'm clever enough to write a fantasy novel. Um, I don't have it, it's just not an instinct that I have. I mean, I I feel like I've said this before, even in this conversation, that I feel like historical is so close to fantasy, but mm -hmm. there is that sort of, you know, the pullback is magic, right? Like there is no, there is no, I don't know. But I but the the Bladesmith Queen was part of an anthology. It was. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was requested, somebody asked me to write a, a story for an anthology that was retelling of Arthurian myth. And I really, really love the story of the Lady in the Lake. Like, I, I love Excalibur. I mean, obviously, I love swords. It's like a whole thing. Uh, they're basically like, you can see the references to swords in every in every book I've ever written. But for me, um, the appeal was writing uh an idea the idea that I had was what if she is what if she is the sword and then I was like how do you you know think about it that way and then of course like how do you make it McLean 
Yeah. And so, and that's, which is the way that I come at everything now is like, well, what are, because I really, I'm not joking around when I say like everything I write is just words until like, I think about readers all the time. Like, what do my readers want? What, you know, what is the world that they love and how do I, how do I give you what you want? Um, and so I don't know is the answer. I don't think there's a fantasy in me. May I mean, never say never. Uh, there are a lot of stories in me that I can see writing over the court, like the next five books, but I, none of them are fantasy, but I have said it a thousand times. I will continue to say it until I do it. I want to write a medieval. I mean, I really, really do. And uh, I just have to find the time to do it because medievals are, you know, not super popular. <laughs> so, But I was so, because I, you know, read The Bladesmith Queen um, and it immediately put me in like a desire for something else medieval. Um, so I jumped into uh, Karen Marie Monning's Highlander series. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, bananas and a ridiculous. And I am just, I'm still in it. Like, I'm still just reading them like voraciously because they're I so mean, great. And there are so God, few. There are so few. I mean, yeah. when I started reading romance in the 90s, there were so many. Yeah. I mean, and it was like, I want to write like men on battlefields with swords, right? Like I want to write tourneys where women like pull the ribbons out of their hairs and like tie them out of their hair and like tie them around, you know, jousting, you know, whatevers. And like, I want it to feel, I want it to really feel like, you know, we're cold and so I'm going to, we have to sleep in the woods and I'm wrapping mm -hmm. you in my tartan, right? Um, and that is because I cut my teeth as a romance reader on like Judith McNaught and Julie Garwood and, uh, Jude Devereaux and those three, especially really like made me a romance reader. And that stuff is so romantic. It's so intense. It feels like, you know, everything is life and death. I mean, I love a book where things are life and death. Yeah. And Thanks. I want it to feel like the stakes are just like at 11 and medievals deliver that every time because it's literally like just giant men just fighting for land Constantly. all the time <laughs> so. yeah. there's like always like kidnappings like yeah pages. like it's yes it's like so keep dramatic. your billionaires like yes. you know the medievals yes elon musk is never ever gonna put a sword through someone and that is his biggest feeling <laughs> Um, all right. So Dana, you want to bring up some audience questions for us? <laughs> Trump's for touches. Just so that we can plan. Well, I mean, the biggest one is enemies to lovers, obviously. Yes. I mean, if these two idiots ever fall in love. That's true. Um, Cause we literally did. We were like, Oh, well what? Cause we like to tie in our summer theme to your release if we can. And oh, we that's interesting. Them, obviously. <laughs> I mean, I'll have to be in touch, but there's a, you know, it's, there's a, there's a forced proximity piece uh, mm -hmm. to it. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I guess you could say kidnapping. I don't know. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Who will be kidnapped is Ooh. the question. <laughs> um, yes, I might have Katie Roberts sells a keychain that's like kidnapping is my love language, which I own, of course. So, <laughs> I, Kelly kidnapping is in the comments. Kelly gets so excited. <laughs> Wait, I want to answer Nick's question, which I just saw float by. I'm sorry, I'm in charge now. Um, yeah. About the beginning. <laughs> Um, it exists, Nick. There is a scene uh, Dutch is found, where Duchess finds Imogen uh, about to blow up her brother's carriage um, and stops her from doing it. And uh, I talk, it's written into the later part of the book. She explains how Duchess found her. And I wrote it and I uh, took it out for two reasons. One, I took it out because I felt like it was repetitive. I felt like we had done, it was more, it held more weight later in the book. Mm. And two, I didn't want Imogen to blow something up. Like I, I wanted to hold back 
if you notice, Imogen actually doesn't blow very much stuff up in this book, and that's intentional. Um, like, I wanted it to feel like when it finally happened, when there was finally a boom on page, that uh, we'd all been waiting for the fuse mm -hmm. to get down to the, you know, the explo the the explosive device. And for me. There was no, I couldn't think of another way for Duchess to collect Imogen other than like this thing that she's sort of known for. Yeah. Um, but also like the pacing, I wanted it to feel like, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? And I couldn't deliver that to you in the first chapter and also keep you heightened. Yeah. So I took it out. And it was a really difficult decision because I like symmetry. Um, and I had a long talk with my editor about it and she was like, you have to think about this book as a book and not a series, mm -hmm. like with what is best for the book. Yeah. And so that was the decision. Yeah. That's so interesting. That is a great question, Nick. Thanks for asking that. Um, all right. Would you be interested in writing any other historical eras? Um, uh, maybe still 1800s, but another setting, New York, New Orleans, um, I saw a similar question from Linda, if you're going to do contemporaries again, ever. I know you have the one story. Um, yes. Yeah. What um, else? Yes, is the answer. I mean, I would really love to write Gilded Age. I want Joanna Shoup and mm -hmm. I, I want Joanna, like, I'm trying to convince Joanna to, like, do something fun, Gilded Agey with me. Um, I say that. Joanna says yes all the time. She's just much <laughs> faster than I am. It's so, I'm like, okay, but could we do it in 2026? Um, and then, and actually, so I said medievals. I also really love a pirate. I mean, listen, I came from, I came from a very particular time in romance. Uh, I was born in a very particular time in romance. So I often think about setting a book on a boat um, with a pirate, but you know, that's then when you really start thinking about like the time period, you're in the like 1600s, like the heyday of piracy was so yeah. early. Like, what am I even doing? Like, what's even happening in the 1600s that isn't yucky in the world? So, um, and then obviously, I would really, really love to see people. I don't know that I'm the right person, but um, I wish there were more 19th century. I wish there were more uh, 20th century romances, like early 20th century romances. Um, it's fascinating, right? Because there is such a demand for historical fiction set in the early 20th century, but we don't seem to have like allowed ourselves to think about our great grandparents boning. Yeah. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's the hold up there. <laughs> I do feel like, at least it feels like in the current market, the, the historical romance lens can feel very narrow. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, and we had done a, a, a broad season last autumn where we were doing like different locations. We, you know, we read Janine Lynn and like, mm -hmm. there's so many other places and time periods like that are so interesting. Um, and it, like readers want them, like publishers, readers want them. Yeah. I mean, I think that there is something, I mean, I don't know. There's something up with historicals right now. You probably have noticed this. Publishers are um, nervous, I think, about historicals in general. And so what I, so while on the one hand, I'm like, ah, don't be nervous about historicals. We're all out here. We still love these books. Okay. And like, not only do we love these books, these are the books that bang in a lot of ways. And I don't just mean like bang. I mean, like they're exciting and like crazy. And there's a reason you guys just did Lorraine Heath, like, yeah. you know, like, Lorraine Heath writes a banger every time. And it's because the way you can suspend disbelief in a historical is very different than the way you can suspend disbelief in like basically anything else. Um, so I, with that said, I feel like one, I think like we're, we're seeing a rise in fantasy in the world right now. And I think in publishing right now and in romance, and I think like the logical next step is for young new readers who came to the genre over the pandemic through Emily Henry to then go like, oh, what else is out here? Are there like, and then they'll sort of come over and find historical. So I'm not worried. On the other hand, I think like the fact that uh, publishers are sort of nervous about historicals is giving me a lot of hope that the historicals that they start to acquire will be out of the Regency. You know, I don't, I'm writing Victorian now, which like most people don't care about the difference, but you know, there is a difference, like, as we're sort of moving toward technology, we're moving toward, you know, women being able to just kind of like do shit in the world, which is really nice. And 
uh, I'd like to see us as a genre sort of think more broadly about, and also about who those stories are about, right? Like I would love to see, you know, there are about three Harlem Renaissance romances. I want there to be, you know, hundreds of them. That's a, that's an incredibly sexy, smart, brilliant time. And I want that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I just feel like we need to, as historical readers, be asking for more, asking writers to do this work and like supporting them, the ones who do. Yeah, exactly. Um, I did see a question from Sophie. You were talking about pirate romances. Um, so he was asking for a pirate romance wreck, but also that was also a good question from Sophie, <laughs> Imogen's brother. Um, and how you crafted him was kind of a, I think a delightful surprise. Listen, especially with the police show up. And even knew stuff. Benedict. Um, I, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, for his book. Charles is his name. I had to look it up the other day because I couldn't remember. And somebody asked me about him, and I was like, "What? Who's Charles?" He's just a brother in a historical. He's just a brother. Um, but there is no such thing as an unmarried brother in historicals, <laughs> uh, which I often forget. <laughs> um, Charles was not intended to be a decent guy. Originally, he was going to be a real asshole, and uh, not like as bad as the villain, but like. He was going to say all the patriarch. He's going to be the mouthpiece of the patriarchy. Yeah. Um, and there was going to be sort of a discussion. In my head, I sort of had this idea that, like, there was going to be this sense of Charles is, like, just one step below. Like, which is even worse. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're the mouthpiece of the yeah. patriarchy, aren't you just the same, right? You just don't. You just haven't hired the police to, like, do crime for you. Um, and I found that I just couldn't do that to Imogen like it was important to me that she have I also wanted Imogen to be wrong like mm -hmm. about something right yeah. there's when you create a character who is so smart and clever and funny and competent as Imogen is it was like it's always it's important to me that sometimes these bells do something that's wrong mm -hmm. in large part because I want them to be called on it and I want them to act in a responsible like adult way when this happens there's a great moment um one of my favorite ways that I've done this before is there's a moment in Day of the Duchess where all the sisters are in the carriage together. You probably, probably people don't necessarily remember this, but, and Serafina has done something wrong and the sisters all call her on it. And they're like, you did that badly. And it hurt all of us. Right. So I wanted Imogen to think that Charles was not ever going to be on her side. And then I wanted to show that, like, sometimes we have we have support from places that we don't expect. Um, but now I'm stuck with a very decent brother. Oh, no. <laughs> <sighs> He's not the Duke of Treviscan, though. So I'll worry about him. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Let's I also have a note on my wall because I've always wanted to write a vicar. Oh. And Tommy's brother is... Stanley is a vicar and I intended to put him into the book and then like it was 120,000 words and that there was just no more room <laughs> um which is a problem when you get deep into a series and then everybody has everybody's paired up and now you just have too many yeah. characters you can't add too many new characters and I had already added like some really great characters who I did not want to get rid of so I have an I have a note on my above my computer and it says Christmas novella with Stanley question mark so yes. <laughs> and say, um, but that would probably be just like a short novella because, you know, Vickers. Yep. <laughs> and Christmas. Yes. I feel like that sounds delightful. Um, all right. Let's do one more question before we wrap it up. Dana, if you have a good one to pull for us. Oh, maybe not. Maybe not. Dana searching. Um, if not, I have one silly question I can end this on, um, which is, so our next theme, um, our fall theme, uh, is going to be vampires. <gasps> Yay. So My favorite. <laughs> so good. You know, uh, so if the Bells and their partners were paranormal creatures. Oh, my God. What creatures would they be? Oh my God, this is not fast at all. This is very I'm serious. Sorry. I know like, it's like maybe it involves. Like, we can just do the bells. If dissertation we want. shit. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's the problem: is I'm such a huge Cressley Cole fan 
that it's very difficult for me to like think about paranormal creatures outside of like the canon of Immortals After Dark. Oh, um, we, the bells it, yeah. are like basically Valkyries, all of them, right? They're just like, they want, mm -hmm. they act with, be good, do crimes, right? Like they, they really know, they, they believe in their mission. They believe that they can have it all. They are willing to, they won't hear that they can't have it all. And so everything they do is toward this sort of general sense of like, we and the people who we love should not have to compromise, right? They lack the ability to compromise. And I love that about them. So there is that. Um, I think Caleb Calhoun is a werewolf. I think in his, in his like greatest, in his most paranormal state, he would absolutely rip someone's throat out if he needed to, but he'd really just like to cuddle. Um, <laughs> I love that. I think, uh, I think that the, I think, um, Adelaide's hero, Duke of Claiborne is probably a vampire, like mm -hmm. sort of, I think he, he, yeah, he, yeah. I think he's very like uptight at the start he's of that book. Her, her neck, right? Yeah, here. exactly. <laughs> he's a vampire. He's uptight. He doesn't like. He just he follow. He's very very rule bound um, until he figures out a way to like bend all the rules. Um, God, Tommy. I don't know. Tommy might be a werewolf too. Honestly, I love it. He's he such a big. Has he growls so much. Oh, he's such a big, oh sweet God. baby. Yes. Oh, Tommy. And he like, oh, Tommy stealing girls' underwear and just trying to get by. <laughs> <laughs> great detail. <laughs> I love it. Yes, I think that that sounds absolutely perfect. Um, <laughs> Great note. Stealing underwear, great note for us <laughs> evening on. Um, so huge thank you to everyone uh, who came out and watched and joined us. Um, if you're not familiar with our group Seasonally Booked Up, there's a link in the caption to our Discord. Um, as I mentioned, um, our fall read-along theme, theme is uh, Fangasm Fall. Uh, so we'll be reading. <laughs> what are you starting with? Uh, so we actually have not revealed the books yet. Oh, but, no. I guess okay. good. Tease one. Mm, right. I don't remember them enough. Okay. Um, we'll be revealing them soon. Um, but we are I very wait excited to hear. About them. Um, and yeah, so our a big thanks to everyone who joined us. To you, Thank Sarah. you all so much. Thanks for reading you know my books and and coming and hanging out with me and liking them enough to want to know more. Right. As my daughter, I told this to, to Kelly and Dana earlier, but uh my daughter said, Mom, it's so nice that people like like you enough that they want to spend time with you. <laughs> I was like, thank you. So thanks for liking me enough to want to spend time with you. Please. Oh, wait. Oh, one, more thing, one more thing for you. You probably can't see very well. Um, I am literally wearing the Mara and Temple No Good Dude. Oh, I love it. Um, oh, my God. Be, it literally has the cover and then the step back on the side. Those so are so cute. Our member Sophie got them for me. Um, and they so are cute. one of my favorites. So you can oh, tell your daughter you. people like you enough to literally wear your <laughs> I am going to tell her that right now. <laughs> well, I am. <laughs> all right. well, thank Wonderful. You so much. Thank, thank you all thank so much. You. I will see you next year, if not sooner. Yes. Have so me on to talk about Immortals After Dark. We definitely will. When you do, definitely you should will. do Sweet Ruin. <laughs> so, okay. No bias. All right. Have a Bye great day, everyone. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye.